On today's show, we're going to make a unique sculpted trestle table. Trestle tables are one of the earliest table forms known to man, and they consist of three parts. The trestle legs, the cross member, and the top. Now even my workbench here is an example of a trestle table. Let's take a closer look. Now, as you can see, all of the primary parts are here. We've got the trestle legs, one on each end. I've got a cross member in the middle, and that provides a lot of rigidity and stops the, the whole thing from racking. And of course, we've got our top here. Now the top is a lot thicker than you might normally have on a trestle table, but this is a workbench, so it has to be thicker. But essentially, the basic form is here. This is really nothing more than a trestle table. Now, although the concept and the principle behind a trestle table is fairly simple, you don't want to let that limit you necessarily in your imagination and the things that you bring to your own table. In this case, I'm going to take influence from a lot of Maloof things that I've seen in the past. Sam Maloof just had a way of combining parts with his furniture, not just his chairs, but his tables and desks, that just was so fluid. You know, one piece just blends right into the next piece, and you really have to look closely just to figure out where the joint is. And that's what we're going for with this piece, a very fluid design. In fact, it's kind of reminding me of the end table that we made uh, probably a couple years ago at this point, the sculpted end table series, where I had to blend the legs into the cross members for this little occasional table. So it may be worth going back and reviewing those episodes before watching all of these. Um, but of course, any design is completely flawed if it doesn't satisfy its intended function. So let's talk about that a little bit. We're gonna to head to my bedroom, actually, and I'm gonna show you where this table is gonna go and what we're gonna use it for. So this is where the table is gonna go, and it's actually replacing a computer desk. Now, I hesitate to call this project a desk because I don't wanna give the impression that we need all the normal storage things that you might need in a good quality computer desk. This really is all about comfort and style. These are our gaming computers. We don't do any work in here. We strictly play games. So Nicole and I will go online and we may spend hours on a particular evening, which means a lot of times we eat meals here. So when we're sitting side by side, this table doesn't really give us enough room to do that comfortably, you know? So we're gonna have to go a little bit longer. We're gonna have to go a little bit deeper. But what we don't really need is all the other storage and things that you might normally put into a desk. So the trestle table, is really nice because it gives us a lot of leg room. There's not a whole lot of um, a whole lot of desk that doesn't need to be there. It's very minimalistic, and we think it's going to work perfectly for our gaming rigs. So let's head back to the shop. So now we know the function, we know the location, and we've even got a few restrictive parameters like the length, the depth, things you know, even the height that are going to you know lock down this design into a particular box, and then within that box we now have an infinite number of things that we can do to satisfy the basic function. So now it comes down to taste. It comes down to what I think looks good and what I think would be a fun project to build. And that's where I just simply take a, a pencil and a piece of paper and I start drawing. Uh, this is nothing more than basic ideas, basic sketches, very rough. You don't have to be good at art at this point because you're really just having fun with it. Get the basic structure down so you have an idea of what looks good and what doesn't look good. And we'll answer the question of whether it works or not later. Right now, the most important thing is to get those ideas out of your head and onto the paper. Now, after creating three or four different concepts, there was one that really stood out from the rest for me, and it was it was the one that really got the message across that I was going for here. Nice fluid curves all over the top, the bottom, and a vertical leg that sort of tilts back to provide a, a really nice visual interest. Now the trick at this point is to take this little drawing and to somehow blow it up to scale because we want to see it full size. So you could, I guess, take this little picture and photocopy uh, and sort of blow it up into multiple pieces of paper and lay them all out so that you got the full size drawing. But for me, I actually get a lot out of that drawing process. Using this as my model, and then I hand sketch it onto a larger full size piece of template stock. In this case, I've got some quarter inch MDF, which works great. You could use quarter inch ply to do this as well. But the process of sketching by hand and modifying these curves and just kind of manipulating the drawing, that's just part of my creative process. I enjoy it and it really helps me get closer to the work and make sure that this piece is designed exactly the way I want it to be designed. 
So I'm going to go over this very quickly because I did spend a lot of time on making these templates in the end table series, but I want to show you for this particular design what my strategy was, and then we'll jump ahead and start with the actual cutting of the real pieces. Now, since this is just a demonstration, I'm going to be using a big fat Sharpie so you can see everything that I do. But obviously, when you're doing this type of work in your shop, a good sharp pencil is the way to go. Now, the first thing we're going to try to accomplish here is putting the building blocks of this structure in place. I'm not worried about curves yet. That's not really important. What I want is to get the basic shapes in place so I can have some things to work off of. Okay, so I know based on my top being 24 inches from front to back, that I want my, my legs to be, I don't know, it's flexible. It's whatever you want it to be, but I'm thinking 18 to 20 inches. So let's start with 18, and I'm gonna place a mark over here. It's my starting point, and I'll measure over. 18 inches is right about there. So this is the front and the back of the foot. I'm going to use my T-square to extend that line. And I'm going to put a mark here with my pencil. I don't want that line to be permanent. This is just a reference line. You'll see why in a second. So I can flip my T-square over and accurately get my other reference line over here. And now we can actually use the marker. This is all rough here, so we're not really looking for perfection. Okay, so I've got the front and the back of my bottom, the front and the back of my top. Now I know the bottom piece, I'm thinking from the bottom of the feet to the point where it joins the vertical piece, it's gonna be about six inches. So I've got my adjustable square set for six. Let's draw that guy in there. Now I know that I want some kind of curvature from this point down. So I'm not really gonna worry about drawing the line all the way across. Uh, the top, let me just double check, I believe the top I wanted to be four inches. So let's draw that in. Okay, now we've got our four inch line. And again, this one is gonna receive some sort of something here. We're just not sure yet, we don't need to be. And we also wanna make sure that we have our vertical piece connecting these two. So this is where you can have a little bit of fun with it because your vertical piece technically could be perfectly straight. You could angle it a little bit. You could angle it severely, but keep in mind the steeper this angle is, the more stress you're gonna have on these joints. So you do need to be careful there. So I was guessing at about 90 degrees. So you can get a protractor out for this if you'd like and make sure that this is set at 90 degrees. But right now I'm just ballparking it Again, if it was in pencil, we'd be able to erase all of this. Let's say right about there. And we'll go uh, with about a two inch wide vertical piece. Now, this straight edge happens to be two inches, so I'm just gonna use that for reference. Okay. The top piece, we have one more thing we can draw in here. The top piece is gonna be a little bit less visually interesting than the bottom because it doesn't need to be. A lot of it's gonna be hidden on the underside of the table. So one thing that we can do is take our adjustable again, and I've got that set at an inch and three quarters. So I'm gonna draw that in here. Draw it in here as well. So you can see what we have to deal with here is this vertical portion here needs to blend in to this area over here. And we've got a disconnect here as well. We want that to be rounded over. So now if this were a pencil, this becomes very easy because now you could just start sketching in like this. Okay, draw these things in. And you get a visual reference for, for what you're actually trying to get to. We need to connect from here to here now. Now how you do that, again, completely up to you, but let's start by just roughly sketching some things in. You see what I do? Uh, this method here just works for me. This is you know, nothing official. I plant my palm, or at least the side of my palm here down, and I use that as almost a pivot point so that I can make a nice even curve. Okay? Now I'm not left-handed, so it's a little bit uh, trickier to do when you're doing a left-handed curve, but you can still kind of just 
very carefully draw these things in. Probably needs to come in a little bit. And I don't mind going wide here because I could always come back with my eraser and start removing things to really refine it. Okay, and that pretty much establishes the basic idea for the top. Let's take a look at the bottom. Now this is where, you know, personal taste comes into play. Sky is the limit here. I mean, literally, you can do anything with how this resolves itself. Uh, here's what I'm gonna do. Just off the top of my head, I'm thinking maybe a two inch foot at the front, a three inch foot at the back, And these two are gonna be connected with some kind of curve. We're not really 100% on that yet, but let's just draw it in. Again, pencil would make this a whole lot less uh, permanent. So this part has to now curve into the body of the foot and terminate down here. So let's very roughly and very lightly start to draw in a curve. This is an inside curve. It's gonna transition to an outside curve, like that, okay? Let's do the same thing on this side, except for this one is a little bit longer. Let's bring it in. You should probably try to match the thickness of this area to the thickness of this area. So you're gonna have to play with these curves a little bit, but I'm gonna draw it in the way I was going, okay? you could simply terminate this down, but what if you added another inside curve real quick and then terminate it down there? And bring that guy down. Okay, this needs work, but you can see where it's going. It gives it a little bit more of a foot if you're going for almost a, a look that's reminiscent of an animal's paw, perhaps. I mean, you could really have some fun with this. So at this stage, all these pencil marks are in here and you could really start to Scribble in, erase, scribble, erase, and it's really a back and forth game until you end up with something that you think looks great. For instance, in here, this is now seeming too thick. So I would probably bring this in a little bit more and bring that down. And I would just erase this line here. To me, that looks a little bit more pleasing. Uh, frankly, I'm not really happy with this curve. I might just say, forget it. Let's bring this guy down and have it terminate like so, all right? This curve down at the bottom actually has a little bit more impact than you might think. If this curve comes up a little bit, and then back down, well, look at the dramatic difference that make, it makes it. In fact, from my vantage point here, it almost makes this look like a bird's uh, talons in a way, or a chicken, which would be funny. But, Anyway, you get the idea where we're going here. And now the final thing that I want is this vertical divider. I don't really want that to be perfectly straight. Ideally, what I wanna do is give it a nice subtle curve, and that's actually way too much. But I'm just kinda of trying to give you the idea here. Little subtle curvature across the whole thing. So now that I look at this, I start to realize that maybe this is gonna be not wide enough because if I'm gonna curve it in a little bit, it's gonna be a little bit too narrow for this table. So I may have to bring this out and widen the whole thing. And then when I bring my curve in, I'll be left with enough material that it's you know, substantial enough and not real spindly and, and skinny looking. Okay, but for the most part, this is how this part of the process works for me. The next thing I'll do is I'll come back to the drawing and after I have a very basic idea, I will take my French curve and try and use that to match up as close as possible to what I thought looked good because the French curve just has naturally pleasing asymmetric curves. So if I can manage to get these close and sort of override what I had in there by eye, the end result will be just much, much more consistent. You know, and you can see a French curve like this can pretty much match any part of this curve that we need it to. Just get creative with it, move it around, experiment and have fun. Uh, but you're gonna be doing a lot of erasing and a lot of redrawing. So now I wanna skip a step. I wanna show you what I've already done so far and catch you up. I did this process and I already created a set of templates. And you can see just my approximation drawing that I did was pretty close. It's not that far off from what I actually drew and then cut out for my templates. 
So I was pretty happy with this, went through the entire process, and I even built a prototype. Let me show that to you. So I basically took my three templates, used some poplar that I had sitting around, some eight quarter and six quarter, and made the three individual parts and connected them to one another. And this is what we've got. Now, from this angle, from this vantage point, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, the curves are where I need them to be. It still needs a little bit of work. We'll have to do some roundovers. This looked okay. What caused me uh, a reason for concern here was when I looked at it from this angle. The problem is, this is a 92 inch long tabletop. These legs are gonna look like sticks. And, and to make matters worse, when we do the sculpting, we're gonna round over a lot of this material. There's gonna be a lot of sculpting going on, which means what looks thin now is only gonna get thinner. So I think if we made the table like this, it would be disastrous because it would look like this beautiful tabletop on these little spindly legs. So again, this profile, not so bad. When you view it from this angle, no good. So eight quarter is not gonna be wide enough. The eight quarter thickness, once milled, comes down to about an inch and three quarters. An inch and three quarters is just not enough. So we're gonna have to glue up uh, wood to get a thicker piece, or I'm gonna have to try and track down some 12 quarter so that we have a substantially thicker uh, foot and, uh, and top here, as well as the center portion. So that's just the way it goes. Now, the other thing is looking at everything here, I decided that the foot is probably a little bit too thin. This is a little bit too thin once I do all the sculpting and rounding over. So overall, this entire piece needs to be blown up. It literally could be scaled up by about maybe a quarter inch in every dimension, and I think we'll be right where we need to be. Add to that using thicker material, and I think we're gonna have it dead on. So let me show you the process of creating what will be now my final templates now that we've learned something from this prototype. So I took my round one templates, basically, and put them on another piece of quarter inch MDF, clamp them in place so they're not gonna move, Get these as lined up as you can here. Once everything is in place, I knew I wanted to add at least a quarter inch in all dimensions. So the compass works great for this. And I just trace around and put the shape in place. The problem was when I was done, I kind of realized that I wasn't completely happy. Let's take a close look at the bottom and I'll show you a real good example. Now, once I added my quarter inch in each dimension, I wasn't really happy with the way that it looked and I needed to give it just a little bit more something. You know, this, this looked okay and on a smaller scale table probably would be fine, but what I thought was a little bit, you know, whimsical and, and charming to an extent now starts to look a little bit sickly. And if it's animal-like, it's certainly an emaciated animal. <laughs> I really didn't like the way it turned out. So when I had that extra quarter inch in each dimension, it was getting me close, but I thought I could do better. And I figured, you know what, let's get rid of this second uh, inside curve here. I don't really like that. Let's just give it a nice, smooth, almost bulbous look to the feet here. So this is what I came up with. Now, you'll also notice it's longer. This was 18 inches, now we have 20. I thought that the stubbiness of the front part of the foot was excessively short. I think I realized that I wanted a little bit more length there. So most of that increase to 20 was given to the front of the piece. Okay, and here's what I came up with. And to me, once this is sculpted and it's made out of 12 quarter stock, it's gonna be amazing. So I'm really happy with this final design. Overall, the curves are just a lot nicer, at least in my opinion, and, uh, and it's gonna be a lot of fun to make. So the next step is to decide where do we cut the top and bottom, and then we can cut the template out. Now on the previous design, six inches was enough to cover this because this has to thin out to the middle piece, not just in the dimension of these curves, but also in thickness. If this is gonna be made from 12 quarter stock, I'm gonna make this middle piece from eight quarter stock. So we'll have to transition this almost as an ankle. It's a very thick ankle though. It's more like a cankle. But anyway, we need to trim it in a way that it looks natural. So if we cut this ankle, if we cut the cankle too short, uh, it's not gonna look right. So we need to make sure that this bottom piece goes up pretty high so that we could uh, trim it down as it blends in. So before we had six inches and it would have ended right here. I don't think that's far enough. I think we're gonna have to go for a full seven inches here. So our bottom piece will need to be cut out of what is basically a seven inch by 20 inch blank of 12 quarter stock. 
That's a lot of meat. Now at the top, previously we had four inches. And I think we can get away with four inches again. Really, all I've done is increase by a quarter inch on this outside edge and a half inch at the bottom to make the, these parts here a little bit more substantial as well. So I think four inch will be perfectly fine for this one. And as you can see, again, we're letting the, the ankle build up a little bit so that we can thin it out and it'll blend in nicely with the thinner vertical piece. Now, just to avoid confusion, I just want to point out here what I'm talking about when I'm referencing tapering from a thicker piece to a thinner piece. Notice this eighth inch ledge here. We're going to need to taper this up so that it eventually gets down to an eighth inch. I think it's going to look really cool. And in fact, on the final piece, I may have that ledge be as much as a quarter inch. And that's why we need enough material here to taper up so that it looks like it naturally blends from a thick foot to a thinner vertical piece. All right, enough talking, enough prep work. Let's put some toxic dust in the air. At the table saw, I cut the top and the bottom pieces away. Then using my track saw, I cut the 80 degree angle for the vertical template. Now I can use the table saw to make a parallel cut which reveals the vertical template. At the band saw, I cut as close to my pencil line as possible without going over. And finally, the oscillating spindle sander makes quick work of finessing the final curves. Now before I cut the curves in my vertical piece, I make sure that I put in my locations of my cross members. I'm going to have two of them. And this is where I think they look the best and you're also going to want to keep in mind functionality. You want to make sure that these aren't in a location where someone's going to bump their knee. And I've done a little testing already and I'm pretty confident that where they are now is exactly where I'm going to want them. So as long as we've got this straight edge, it's very easy to draw these. So now I can cut my curve. So the templates are done and, you know, I'm really happy with the way these turned out. I think the, the beefier look is going to be much more appropriate for a table of this size, especially when you compare them to the originals. These now look like, I mean, maybe I could use these to make a similar desk that's half the size, you know, half the length. Maybe that would look okay with this material, but I think this is much more appropriate for our table. Now, our first prototype, I mean, it really taught me a lot about what I was doing wrong with this piece and gave me a lot of perspective. The truth is, a second prototype could be just as valuable. I mean, I think this really set me on the right path, but I think I could refine things a little bit more if I had the time to build a second prototype. The problem is, as always, time. I just don't have enough time to build a second prototype, analyze it, redo the templates, and do this whole process over again. I think these templates are close enough at this point that I feel confident going into this and making a project. Now, perhaps this project just becomes version one, of this table and then I can make a subsequent improvement down the line and build another one. It's just like the, uh, the end table that I made. I got so much great feedback from you guys about what I could do differently the next time I build one. So if and when that time comes, I'm going to use that information to improve upon the design and make it even better. But that doesn't mean that the original wasn't good enough to live in my house. And in this case, this one, I think at this point, is ready to be built and to sort of take the concept and make it a reality. So we're just gonna push forward and hopefully we won't uncover any uh, dramatic issues. I think we'll be okay. So now I need to make the blanks for this project and the wood I'm gonna use is Honduran mahogany. This is a piece of eight quarter and I was really looking for 12 quarter for this because ultimately when you're carving those parts and making all these curves, the more glue lines you have, the more grain interruption there is, and it tends to be a little bit of an eyesore. So you have to be careful if you glue up pieces to make them, you know, into nice thick chunks of wood. So I looked for 12 quarter, couldn't find it anywhere. Nobody had 12 quarter, so I was stuck with using 8 quarter. This worked out for the better because ultimately two pieces of 8 quarter is going to give me a thicker piece of material than one piece of 12 quarter. So 
Ultimately, I think it's gonna work out in our favor, but we do have to be careful of grain direction. So it's important to try to cut your parts that you're gonna to glue together, cut them out of the same board. So if uh, each of my pieces needs to be about 20 inches, I'll take these two and put those together and just try to get the end grain to match up really nice. And hopefully in the end, it'll be a pretty seamless uh, connection between the two pieces. But these are big, heavy timbers. Uh, obviously watch your back as you're moving these pieces around, but the sooner we get these cut down into smaller, more manageable pieces, the better, so let's get started. So I let the glue ups dry overnight and at this point they're ready to be milled once again because that glue up isn't absolutely perfect. We need to remove some of the material to make sure everything is square, flat on both sides and we're at the final thickness that we really want here. Now I'm at about three and five eighths and the target thickness is three and a half inches. So I've got plenty of room. An eighth is more than enough to get this thing down to be perfectly flat, square and parallel. The one thing I will caution you though is look at your joints and make sure that any of that glue squeeze out is scraped away because that can cause you problems on uh, your jointer and planer blades. So one of these scraper tools is great for this. And I'm gonna remove a lot of wood so I'm not too worried about being super careful here. And you can see when you put the template up there that I do have quite a bit of extra stock here, which is good. You know, it's better to have a little bit more than uh, not enough, that's for sure. So let's head over to the jointer, get these guys milled up and probably use the planer and drum sander as well to get these to the appropriate thickness. Now I've got my vertical parts of the legs, it's this part here in the clamps and I had to do a little bit of a glue up there too because I couldn't get the right thickness using just the single board. So what I'm using are two pieces of six quarter together and I'm just gonna let that dry overnight. Uh, in the meantime, I can start tracing on the shapes for my other parts, the tops and bottoms and start working on those. Now you'll notice I haven't done any cuts on the end grain because it's just not necessary. Once I trace this on, I'm gonna cut around this curve and where it stops, it stops. I don't need a perfectly square end. And the same thing for the top here. Neither one of those edges have been cut. They just don't need to be. What is important is that the width is exactly what we want it to be. For instance, this piece is four inches wide. This piece is seven inches wide. And the reason that needs to be nice and even is because Number one, the bottom part is going to be the thing that rests against the floor. So if that's not nice and straight, that's gonna create a problem. The top is where we have some joinery going on. So if this isn't nice and straight and also parallel to this line here, we're gonna have problems there too. So the same thing goes for the top template piece only with four inches. Okay, so all we have to do at this point is line it up so the feet here are flush, make sure I'm inside of my edges. Get a nice sharp pencil, trace around. Now negotiating these curves could be a little bit tricky. If you're just using a regular 14 inch bandsaw or even smaller, it could be tough going, okay? This is a lot of material to have to cut through. So what I've got is a nice, relatively new blade. It's a wood slicer blade. It's about a quarter inch, might even be a little bit less, looks less to me. 
Uh, but this will allow me to very easily navigate through any type of curve that I need to get through. Certainly it's thin enough for this operation. Uh, you could probably get most of this done with a blade that's even you know, approaching a half inch, should have no problem with these curves. The key though is you want to make sure that your bandsaw is set up perfectly. If it's not square, if your table is slightly off from the blade, as you're cutting through something that's this tall, you may think you're tracking perfectly as you look from the top. But once you get to the end and you finish that cut, if that blade was on an angle, you'll cut into what we're going to refer to as the keeper material, the stuff we want to leave untouched. And that's not a good thing. So if you think you might have some you know, wobble going on or you think the blade might be a little bit out, stay a little further away from your line and then you could always sand back or cut again later to get a little bit closer. Better safe than sorry. So uh, let's get ready to fire this up, put on our protective gear and the key here, Take your time. Don't go too fast. If you go too fast, you'll stress the blade. You can knock everything out of whack if you're pushing too hard. It's a lot of meat to be cutting at one shot, so let's get to it. Now, my first cutoff here, I could just show you. Pretty darn square, right? So if you can do that, you could check your cutoff and you notice that the blade is tracking uh, straight up and down, you could be more confident going into your next cuts and get closer to the line. Now to get my pieces to their final shape and basically get back to the line that I drew with my template, I'm going to use my oscillating spindle sander. Now if you don't have one of these, you could certainly use a router and a flush trim bit and you just want to attach your template to the workpiece. Now I've done that a number of times on the show, so I don't think there's any real reason to show you that, uh, but I will say that for this project, I really didn't even see a need to do that necessarily. If there's any slight, and it would be very slight, variances after using the oscillating spindle sander, it's really not gonna be noticeable. I'm gonna do so much carving and rounding over of these pieces, and you know I'm not gonna get too far from the shape of the template so I don't really see necessarily a need to deal with all that. So once I'm sanded back to my line, I'm pretty confident that that's as, uh, as, far, as far as I need to go. Um, so I'm just gonna do some last little bit of cleanup here, but remember, these are still very rough. I've gotta do a big round over on them. I'm gonna have to attach them to the vertical piece and start tapering some things here and there. So there's still quite a bit of work to do. Uh, you don't really need these to look perfect just yet. Now here's one of my vertical blanks, all glued and milled up. I've got it to the point now that it's about two and five-eighths of an inch thick. And again, that's the result of putting two six-quarter pieces together. Now you can see the way the template goes on here. I got it backwards like that. Okay, what we're gonna have here are two cross members that are gonna join into this vertical piece. So we have to start thinking about locating that joinery. If we do it now while the piece is still square, it's gonna be much easier. And the joinery that I'm gonna use for this is gonna be loose tenon joinery, and I'm gonna use the domino to do it. Um, I usually try to show you guys, you know, classic mortise and tenons whenever possible, but I figured this was a good time to show you the domino because it's really one of the things that the domino excels at, and that is joining things that are at different angles. It just, you'll see when we get to that point in the process, it's just gonna simplify things dramatically for us. But in order to use it, I need accurate index lines that tell me where to plunge the bit into. So on my template, I've drawn the two locations uh, where I would like those cross members to go. And I want two dominoes for each, okay? They would go in like so. So what I need to do is transfer these lines to my blank. So I've already transferred my lines to the end of my template so that I can see them when I flip it upside down like this. If everything looks good, I can then just put a little pencil mark here. That's gonna give me the locations. Now all I have to do is extend these down so that they're actually into the meat of the workpiece. Now since I want my cross members to be roughly in the middle of this board, I basically took my measurement from the template, set my adjustable square, and just draw a line across. And that gives me the dead center point where each one of these guys is going to go, like that. So with our joinery marked out, we can now focus on cutting the 10 degree uh, angles that we need on each end of this workpiece. Let's head over to the miter saw. Right, so I'm set here for a 10 degree cut. I'm just gonna line up my laser 
with my pencil line and make my cut. Now I can just slide it over to the other side, move my clamp so that I can secure it in place. Line everything up. And we'll make the second cut. Now I don't want to get too much into a Festool Domino demonstration, but essentially if you're trying to figure out how this machine works, think of a biscuit joiner. Although it's fundamentally different in terms of the type of joint that you get out of it, the concept of you know, how the machine works and how you place your marks on a workpiece is very similar. So I've got my crosshairs here. Here's the problem. What would be really nice is if I could just reference off the front of the uh, leg here and then plunge straight down. The problem is my fence at its full height does not allow my bit to get low enough. I'm just a bit short. So one of the great things about the domino is that if you have the reference marks here, like we have this horizontal and a vertical reference line, you can actually just, without any support, drop this in place and plunge down. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Just making, uh, very, just making sure that everything is lined up with these lines. If they're not, it's very easy to tweak it out one way or the other. But one thing that's gonna help me is knowing that if the bottom of the uh, domino here is an inch from the surface, I know I'm right where I need to be. And I measured this earlier, lining it up by eye and then taking a measurement on what I had. So this will come in handy to double check me before I plunge down. Then the only other thing is I gotta worry about this center line. You can see the domino has a bunch of different reference lines here. This is the one that tells me I'm in the middle. So as long as I know that I'm an inch from the edge, like so. And once my center line is marked and in place, right there, now I should be safe to plunge down and create my mortise. And now with our mortises cut, it's safe to cut the curves and do the final smoothing to finalize the vertical pieces. I'm going to use the same exact methods that I used to do the top and the bottom pieces. So the curves on the vertical piece are now nice and smooth and I could start to think about the type of joinery I want to use for the connection of the vertical piece to the top and the bottom pieces. Once again, I think the domino is going to be the quickest, simplest way to do this. So all I really need are my index marks here on both the vertical piece and my foot. And once I have those in place, it's just a matter of once again plunging down to create the mortises. Now one thing I do want to talk about is these dominoes. If you look at the domino on the surface here, that may not look substantial enough for this joint. But what you have to remember is we're going to be removing a lot of stock from these pieces. And when it's all said and done, these legs are going to be a lot more slender than they look right now. So there won't be nearly as much material there. And if you have too many joints, too many mortise and tenon joints, or it's just simply too large, you could wind up cutting into it later. And we want to make sure that we don't do that. So two should be plenty for this joint once it's all thinned out. So I've got my marks here. I'm just going to make my cuts. And incidentally, the process is going to be the same for both of the bottom joints and of course both of the top joints. The top piece is very similar in shape to the bottom piece. Uh, they're all the way over there, but you, you get my point here. But for the most part, we're just joining these two together. Now, the reason why I think the domino is a really good choice for this is we have an angle here. There's a 10 degree angle cut on that piece. So if you were to actually make an integral mortise and tenon there, you might have a little bit of a challenge deciding whether this tenon should be angled with that 10 degrees, should it be perpendicular to the 10 degrees. It can get really tricky. So, you know, maybe someday in the future we'll cover uh, construction techniques to do something like that with a traditional mortise and tenon, but the domino, you know, just makes it so much faster for me and I need to get moving on to the next project. So it's just the quickest solution. Let's see how we did. If everything lines up perfectly, we're good to go. Oh yeah. 
that's what we're looking for. So just gonna do a quick dry assembly, make sure all the joints came out the way I hope they did. That's my top piece. on The Wood Whisperer. I'm gonna to switch to my cabinet maker's rasp and just start to try to clean things up a little bit more. Now where this joint meets here is a whole bunch of end grain, which is what I'm spreading the glue on now. I've got two Honduran mahogany boards here. The biggest one is a full 14 inches. Want to take your woodworking to the next level? Join the Wood Whisperer Guild. <laughs>